I say about some, some, something about you and stuff. Yeah, I've been working with HPC for a couple of <coughs> more than a couple of decades and been involved with the, all aspects of it. I, for some time, I worked for a company called Scali who developed MPI software and, and cluster software, Norwegian company. And that was sold off to, to IBM and then I left for University of Oslo. So I've been playing around with things for, for quite some time. And most of the things that I'm interested in is using and, and the optimization and using the resource effectively because there are several ways of doing it. I just had a discuss with you in the morning that if you want to go from Oslo to Bergen, most people, if you follow, would like, well, most, well, some people will go west, some people will go east. The people that go east will notice that it takes a considerable amount of hours to get to Bergen. And then they start doing all kinds of optimization, better jet engines, better airplanes, even go people go off the wall to rockets and such, when they could have taken the other path and do it in an hour in a normal plane. And this is not unheard of. It's quite often that people optimize and are barking up the wrong tree. So I'm not really going to address that, but this is something to think of that you should do a sanity check and so on when you run, not to waste all the resources in, in a, a non-efficient way. So this is mostly what I'm talking in the first, um, the first part is running programs, especially I'm focusing on the first session that uh, not people who develop the program themselves, but run programs they've already got. So what can you do in the Slurm settings? What kind of environment can you set up to, to get better performance than all the defaults? And regarding the, the programming example yesterday about the parallel sharing of workload, you buy two turtles and it doesn't go any faster. And there is also a twist to this because from time to time we get people complaining that uh, the processors in, in a supercomputer is not faster than my laptop. My laptop is actually faster. And that's true, but the supercomputer has many of them. 172,000 cores to be precise on Betsy. And you need to do them in parallel, hence the parallelization. I'm going to talk about resources, setting the correct environment, and then scaling. Scaling is very important as we discussed yesterday. And um, I'll go dig deeper into it in both talks. So running programs, you can do interactive runs, you can reserve resources for interactive use, and you can set up a batch execution. We have run batch execution for, for more than 60 years now, so this is well known. Interactive usage of front end. Almost, well, not daily, but weekly, or maybe several times a week, we have users complaining that somebody is running interactive jobs on the front end. Very short testing things to test if the input is working, compiling, and small, small things are okay to run on, on the front end, but not production jobs, and not things that takes more than a few minutes or tens of minutes is okay. And if you use a lot of memory, it's not okay to run it on the front end. Compiling and testing is okay. Copying files is okay. But anything that takes a considerable amount of resources is not okay. And you can do a reservation, which is covered in, in, in the documentation. Syntax differs slightly from, from the different systems. So look up for the system in use, either Saga, Fram, or, or Betsy. Ah. This is what I hate when this happened. I haven't been able to figure out why this happened. Oh. This is the plague that you get when you do things in Google Docs and online. So we go to the batch queue system. It's Slurm, and then um, it says made by SCADMD, develop it. So you can go there to have a deeper insight in the documentation. And all batch jobs are submitted using script, bash, Python, Julia, R, any scripting language that uses a hash as a comment is as a comment character is okay. Again, 
re please read the documentation. This is an example how you can do it in different languages. Some big project actually uses Python as, as the um, scripting language for running the job. It's an interesting twist that Lua, which is used internally by Slurm to write scripts, is not supported because it doesn't have the hash as a common sign. But you can do quite a lot of interesting things if you, if you, if you use Python as the scripting language. Go to the documentation and look on the and how to submit how to submit work. So it's it's well written, and if you have something that you can find, file a, a ticket, and then we can update the, the documentation. So launching your executable is fairly simple. You can do if you have a serial, it's just using a dot out. I've been so lazy in the later years that I don't bother. So many of the programs when I do testing just get the default a dot out. And I'm not alone because if you go in to see what people are running, the, the most popular programs to run is a dot out or prog dot x. So this is how to do it because many people think that they have to do this M minus NP to have to set the number of ranks or, or CPUs that you want to use. And it doesn't matter because Slurm set up all of this for you. Or you can use SRAN or Slurm, but MPIRN is the most common. That will set up everything for you. So you can just launch the program with MPIRN and your executable. For OpenMP, it's only one executable, so that's easy and the same for serial. I'll come into later about the SRUN and the difference between SRUN and, and the MPIRUN. MPIRUN has, of course, a lot of other options that you could use, but the simplest case is just running with the, without anything, and Slurm will fix the rest for you. I'll also show how Slurm set up the environment to do this. So, that brings us to the next subtopic, resources. So request the resources because when you start a Slurm job, you set up some kind of resource pool that you want to have. You ask for the number of nodes, number of CPUs, number, number of memory. Um, this is different from system to system because on Saga, you can actually specify only a single core and submit that. On the other systems, it, the, the rules are slightly different. Like on Betsy, there is a minimum amount of, of nodes that you can ask for. And as you implied by my sentence, a number of nodes, you cannot ask for anything less than a node. And you cannot ask for even a single node on Betsy, you have to ask for and multiple nodes. So we encourage people to use as many as possible because we Betsy is a very big machine made for big parallel jobs. So anything less than a thousand cores is discouraged to run on, on, on Betsy. So on Thrum, it's an intermediate machine. The largest jobs you can then, but the Thrum contains, some, it's made up of, of three islands. And one of the islands have about 10,000 cores. So it's possible to run the job very nicely at the size of 10,000 cores. But most jobs that people run are in the range of from a few tens of cores to a few thousands of cores. So very, very few people run jobs that span the whole island on Thrum. And even the same goes for Betsy. But Betsy is, is more symmetrical. So, so there is no, this concept of island is only pretend for for, for the from system. But you, you ask for all the resources you need, including the runtime. Runtime was under discussion yesterday. You, it's impossible to know how much time your job will take when you haven't run it before. So you just have to set it to a very long time. But most people run the same job with slightly different inputs. So after the first run, you have a very good knowledge of, of, your, of your runtime. But please do not set it close to what you have before. If there is a slight problem with, let's say the disk system has a high load, the job, your job could take slightly longer. And it's very, very bad if you have a run for 48 hours and your job crashes, that you then you lose the whole, um, the whole two days of, of work. You have to start all over again, or the job is re-queued or you have to re-queue it yourself. So 
ask for slightly longer runtime because there is cases when your job takes longer than you expect. Then there is the problem with the, with the storage. I have a slide on this because there is a misconception or the, most of the jobs are running in, in the wrong way. The storage during during a run is called something called scratch, or there are different ways of doing scratch. And of course, the persistent, which is your home directory, project directory, or something called user work, it's also on the parallel file system. I was afraid that this would happen. I've seen it before, but I didn't think it was. Here I've seen that you, yeah. So this is, I saw on the chat yesterday that, uh, or on, on HackMD that people ask for this. So um, SPATCH nodes set control the number of nodes that you specify. If you're running anything serial or, or you are running uh, OpenMP jobs, which is called shared memory. And shared memory means that, of course, there is only one memory that you share, and that is only possible on a single node. So for any OpenMP job, threaded jobs, you have to set the number of nodes to one. So node controls the number of nodes you specify. N tasks per node control the number of MPI ranks per node that you get. So if you set this number to one, two or three or whatever, this will be picked up by the environment and pushed forward or forwarded to MPI via, via environment variables. I, I'll, I'll show you how that works later on, but this is maybe the only time in your life that you will ever see that because this is taken care of by Slurm and MPI. Most people don't really bother how MPI works behind the scene and especially the MPI run command, but it actually do this via M uh, environment variables. So there is nothing magic with the MPI run command. Hence, you can use srun instead, and then let's learn take care of this. Then there is this interesting thing called CPUs per task. This variable actually controls how many threads per rank or task that you have. A uh, threaded job is typically an open MP job because few people will hurt themselves by writing threaded using the pthread library themselves, which is doable, but it's painful and tedious and not very fun. So uh, open MP was invented to fix this for you. And open MP is like playing chess. It takes 10 minutes to learn the rules when it takes a lifetime to master it. So OpenMP, while you can parallelize a loop in, in 10 minutes, getting it to scale to a large core count and to do it perfectly, it's, it's more like an art. It, it, it's, it's a bit complicated. But to start is very easy. And the OpenMP is very, very popular. So the CPUs per task controls the number of ranks, no, the number of, of threads per rank, or the number of threads in general. And it will also set this famous variable OMP number of threads, which controls how many threads the OpenMP will use. Because the default is normally to use all the threads in the machine. And some programs will, will see, oh, OK, here are 40 CPUs. I'll set the OMP variable to 40 myself. But you have only requested two. That means that your program my, if it doesn't set the variable OpenMP, OMP number of threads to, to correctly, it might launch 40 threads onto two CPUs and your program will almost grind to a halt. So it's important to, to, to set this correctly and hopefully your program will, will honor the OMP number of threads variable. So I have an example here when we have two nodes, two n tasks per node, and two CPUs per task. That this is from Saga, so that will give you a node list. This is learn variables that you can actually print out in your in your script. Um, you see that we get two nodes. 
C325 and C512. There are two distinct nodes. Uh, it says that there are four N tasks. N tasks is um, set by, by multiplying the number of nodes with the number of, with the N tasks per node. So in this case, four. And you see Slurm also has a knowledge of how many tasks per node, N tasks per node. Then it also know how many CPUs you asked for. And you see the Slurm nodes, N nodes is set to two, N prox is set to four. Slurm CPUs on a node is four because we request two CPUs and two ranks, so that's four. And this uh, famous OMP number of threads variable is set to two. So if we launch an MPI program with this, it will launch two ranks per node and each of those ranks will run two threads. It's not very good at all. Let me switch to the other one. Yeah. So for the same again for MPI applications, this is what the MPI run picks up or set and then your MPI executable will read in this and this is what um, from the Python program yesterday this is hidden behind the scene for for the Python programmers and for most programmers but if you program in a lower level language you will run call functions that actually read out these variables so they will see that PMI <laughs> which is, they, it's, it's a mixture of MPI, but PMI is actually the name of the, of the variable, is set to four. So when you call the init, you will get four ranks in total. As you see the zero, one, two, and three. And then you will have two local ranks, which is not really necessary for MPI, but that doesn't matter. And you will know that you, your MPI program will have four ranks and then all these four executables that it run will have assigned rank zero, one, two, and three. And it's common practice in MPI to set the zero rank as the master. So normally you just set master equals uh, the test of, of, of rank equals zero. So and there is a, this com world is the communicating world which is normally just set to, 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 to be global for all MPI ranks, but it's possible to set it to some set of ranks, but it's less used, but it's possible to do. So pure MPI jumps to run is fairly simple. You just set S batch to the number of nodes you want to have. And that in the case of Betsy, you can set N tasks per node to 128. This you have to set because you can set it to other things that controls the number of MPR ranks per node. And for Betsy, it's 128 cores on a single node. And eight nodes, you can just multiply 128 by eight and you get the number of ranks in total. So best practice is you end task per if you run, want to run bigger jobs is to set it to the number of nodes on each node. Saga has 40 from 32, Betsy 128. Um, but some of the, the, this is for the common compute nodes. There are other nodes who have more, more or less cores, um, in most cases more. So you have to check if you are running huge mem or large mem or, or something else than the normal compute node that, um, that you set that number accordingly. But for people that are running this big jobs, then you have already normally read the documentation and have a good grasp of what you do. So the thing is that the, the, the newer machine have, have more cores than the older one. So let's say with the, with the AMD processors, that's 128 is, is the biggest you have, but it might be more in the future. So for a shared memory, um, OpenMP and threaded jobs are, are, are quite popular. There's a lot of, of, of um, applications that runs only in shared memory. 
you set the number of nodes to one and you set the CPUs per task to, to something like eight. That will set the variables accordingly, as you can see in the slide on the, the variable set here. Ah, we can switch to the other one. I had to change the background to from, from UIO to MRIS, so that's why. This is so-called hybrid jobs. This is an MPI job with, um, with four MPI ranks, two per node, and two threads per rank. And I printed out Hello World and listed what things are on. So this takes time to read this slide, but this prints out all the threads and, and so on how it is mapped onto the different nodes. You can see there are only two nodes in question, C16 and C17, and they run two ranks on, on each node and each of them run two threads. So this is hybrid job. Hybrid jobs can be, can be tricky because, uh, first of all, MPI can scale to a very large core count depending on how it's written. Some programs doesn't scale that well, some scale better, which is the MPI part. Then comes the OpenMP part, how many threads are optimal for the threaded part of your MPI application. So this you have to figure out, and this you have to measure, do some scaling test together with first, starting with the scaling test of the MPI, then the scaling test of OpenMP, then figure out what's the optimal rank number and how well does the OpenMP part scale. So you have to optimize both of them. And then the other thing you cannot be emphasized enough is that each MPI rank is totally independent of any other MPI rank. They don't know about each other. The only thing is that they are launched together and they have a common communicator so you can send messages from one of them. So there's actually nothing special, nothing magical with an MPI program. They are just all the same running, the same code run at the same time. It doesn't even have to be the same code because I had once written a program that was a pipeline that had four MPI, the four different executables. Then we've done with, with um, some of the resources. Now we can think of allocating memory. It was discussed briefly yesterday and the other one will come back later with, with this, but the simplest way of figuring out how much memory you actually used is to look on the Slurm log file. And as I said yesterday, in the comment is that this is the most important output file that you have. It contains so much information in very few lines. You can see here that the average resident and max resident is the same. Uh, RSS stands for resident memory, which the actual physical memory you need. If you don't have enough memory, it will swap and the program will grind to a halt. So you need to have enough memory to accommodate for, for the resident. So RSS stands for resident, which is physical memory, and you have to have enough of it. Otherwise, your program won't, won't complete. Well, it, it will take forever. So you get the number here. You can also see these pages, it should be zero. If you have any paging and so on, you have a problem. So if one, one or two is okay, but if that number is big, then there's something is wrong. So this one used only 248 meg, which is close to nothing. I think, I think it was a very small program around just to check the output file. So please do review the output file to get the information and all, if your program stops, then some sensible error message are also present that one. <sighs> Try again. Try the other. So this is the important thing as I talked about the traveling from Oslo to Bergen. Storage during execution. Are all your data available? 
how do you store your output data? What about scratch data during a run? Have you considered the access? Is it sequential or random? And what the size of the random? Uh, random write or read uh, start to become, or for all practical purposes, if you are doing it in chunks of one megabyte or more. So randomly reading and writing a megabyte, chunks of megabyte, then it compares to the sequential. So if you have large chunk, larger than one meg, then you don't have to bother with the, with the random because it's going over to the sequential regime. But uh, the favorite benchmark, I also normal, um, runs normally the test with 64K. Um, that's very bad for the file system if you do random read with 64K. Then are you sharing data using files with, between several nodes during a run or several ranks during a run? Are you opening the same file for read and write or reading? Reading is okay, but the writing to several nodes at the same file, then you need the parallel file system, which might not be the best option. So make sure all data is present. Don't let a large number of cores just sit idle because a single core is copying and downloading input data. Stage the data to somewhere before you start. What's the output data? Uh, somebody told me not too long ago that the you're redirecting the, the log log. Things like programs like Gaussian and, and, and Worf produce a huge amount of output data. And redirecting those to dev null would be a, a neat idea because you don't have to, to write to the parallel file system. It could speed up a few percent. Scratch data. This is generally data that is either a read and write tremendously amount during a run. Gaussian is famous for having an RWF file, stands for read and write file, which is re read and written quite a lot. Many other programs also have that. OpenFOAM is normally setting up a single file per rank, even though you can get away with that and, and lump them together. There are a way of doing it. Um, on Saga, there is something called local scratch, which has huge benefit because if you ask for local scratch instead of scratch, then your local your scratch file is put on a uh, memory memory disk. It's an NVMe RAM disk, which is much faster. Sequential or random, so. If you are doing random I.O., which is generally to be avoided, but sometimes it cannot be avoided, but random read is the worst you can ever do because you are asking for a small chunk of data from a disk and it's nightmarish for the file system to, to handle this. If you need to share, then the, the, the variable scratch is the only option because that's a, a, scratch, file, a scratch area directory on, on the parallel file system. So that's your only option if you actually need to share file, but you can use both of them. I shouldn't have changed the background. So you can review the documentation, file storage for clusters. Scratch is normally put under or is always put under work jobs class. It should only be, there's a mistake. It's a cluster work jobs and slur my, I don't know why this is twice. It's a, my mistake. So it's under cluster work jobs slur, but it's pointed to by the environment variable scratch. And there is a local scratch it's on Saga. This is only implemented on Saga. Um, it's on an MVME RAM uh, memory disk, and it's limited to 800 gig in size. Unfortunately, on on the local system in Oslo, it's limited to to to, to three terabyte, uh, or, or on the front end, so it's the seven. But uh, on Saga, we are limited to 800. But that might not might be okay. 
So I run this test. Um, if you use Scratch, you get some numbers for sequential read and write. They are, I will put them as comparable, even though they differ slightly, but they are comparable. Uh, the problem is the random read. The parallel file system, which is supposed to be quite good, is BGFS based on Saga. It comes out clocks in at six megabytes per second. And we are talking about the supercomputer here, which has gigahertz processors and you clock in at, at six megabytes per second. Sequential write is slightly better, but still low. Then if we ask for, if you request the local scratch in, in Slurm and use the local scratch to run this IO zone test on local scratch, we get, first of all, we get some better number for sequential, but that's not really the big issue here. I mean, the numbers are two times and so, which is, which is okay. But look on the random read. If you go to the graph, you see that you cannot barely see the performance on, on the graph. And for sequential write is, is slightly better. Um, this IO zone job I run, it took 20 hours using Scratch and 47 minutes using the local Scratch. So this is comparable to traveling from Oslo to Bergen and 99.2% of the jobs are going east and 0.8% is going west. To Bergen. So I think that many of you should consider using local scratch if possible, because it's so much faster. But of course, if you look on the graph, if you are doing sequential, the gain is less than if you are doing random. So this is something you have to consider. And if you read the advice on the former slides, you'll see that you should have a review of what you are doing. If you are uncertain of how to think, how to really do that, then you file a ticket and ask, or, uh, or read documentation, and then file a ticket and ask, because it's, it's not that hard to figure that out. Then we go to the, what can you do with the environment, mapping and binding, and controlling the runtime system. There's a few tricks you can play. This is how you set the number of threads and CPU per task 64 is maybe a bit high because OpenMP doesn't normally scale that well, but I, I put it up for how to do it. And it could be interesting to, to do it, that, put that in, echo the number of threads so you have a, a grasp of how many threads you are using. But it's, of course, it's the CPU per task that gives you that number. <sighs> Maybe we can try again. I'm afraid it doesn't work. <sighs> ah, no. For um, OpenMP, there are a few things you can do. You can. First of all, you can you can put in n n um, evn in your script and print out all the variables that you set. It's a long long list, more than one page, several pages. But you can do some grep with OMP and so on. You can see that it's possible to set it to false, true, close, and spread. And here is a, one of my favorite set of benchmarks. It's a very old one from NASA, which you call NASA parallel benchmarks. And you can see that uh, putting it close made the best performance. There was slightly less difference between the others, but close was a good match. It's not easy to know exactly beforehand which one of those are the best so you need to do some testing. And you can see that setting it to none is, is um, just using the default. So this is something that you can test, put it a small input data set and, and do a run, run through all of these and see how things work. Maybe your spread will be better for you or, or true or false or whatever. It, it's not so easy to know. You can also place it. 
tomorrow, uh, you know, later today, I'll, I'll explain why why this is so. By because the memory is not not all memory is is equal. Some memory are more equal than others, so it's different. So that's why things happening as they are. You can put it to place. You can ask it to to put it on threads, cores, and sockets. And in this case, put using some cores were more beneficial than threads or sockets. It's also something you could test. So running MPI programs here, I'm set with with them um, eight thousand cores. And the only thing you need to do is either to set um, I underscore MPI. This is for the Intel MPI. Uh, most of my examples are with the Intel MPI. And both Intel MPI and Open MPI is supported on the system. So I'm using mostly Intel MPI for, for the course. You just start MPI run. You can put up some options, but well, where options is not minus MP because you don't have to bother. In most cases, there is no options needed. So just that. MPI run and your executable and you're good to go because Slurm is setting all the other things for you. Then we can tune at runtime. You see, I, I asked for 1024 nodes, which is a fairly large one. Um, this example is not, is not run with 1024 with nodes. But the, as I said, there is something called collective operations. That is operations that span all ranks. The simplest one is barrier. That is a barrier, a fence set up so that all processes, all the ranks need to come to this fence before it's released to go further. So this is some kind of synchronization that you are at this point in your source code, you are sure that when you call the barrier, all it will wait until everybody is at that function. So the barrier function is like a fence. And when everybody reached the fence, the fence is open and you continue. And the one I've used here is an all to all vector one. And all to all is sending a message from everybody to everybody, which is a quite complicated thing. And you can change the MPI collective algorithms. This is fairly advanced, but it's actually one of the things that you can easily do with just environment variables in your script. So you can either ask if somebody has something to suggest for you, or you can run a test figuring out which, which one to set. So this is not a lecture on, on how to do that, but it's uh, nice to show show with you that you can do a few things easily within the, the, your Slurm script if somebody have told you or you have figured out what to do. You can see the performance went up from 2,966 mega operations in total to 3,271 mega operations. So it's a significant gain. <sighs> Or you can put it, you can also see the slides here. Try it, it will load. No, it won't launch. Anyway, here I, uh, I requested um, the lightweight statistics, which you can just set these variables. Um, I've noticed that uh, not all the Intel compilers are. are honoring this correctly. So if you do the 2019, it's normally works. You just set those three MPI stats to three and MPI stats scope to collective. And it will generate a file called stats.txt. And you can see here, it's calling, it's been using all reduce, all to all and all to all V, broadcast and reduce, but the all to all V is the biggest one. And you could run through the different collective algorithms. Uh, Intel, man into documentation have all the details. We try to, no. So scaling, 
uh, one thing that you could do is to run the ARM performance report, provides a quick overview with quite a lot of information. And here's around, around another of, of the kernel of the NASA benchmarks. And the message to take home here is that memory access account for 71.7% of the runtime. So most time was spent waiting for memory, which point us to the biggest obstacle of all scientific applications, or not all, but most of them, is that they are memory bound. We can go back to review a roof line. If you're interested, you look up on roof line on, on Wikipedia. But the point is that this is an easy way of seeing whether or not your application is memory bound or not. And most scientific applications are memory bound. And of course, the memory bandwidth on modern processes are not where as, as high as it should be the process is much much faster than the memory so you end up having to wait for memory regardless of your fast your computer is and the memory speed is as it is the memory bandwidth increases from year to year but the access time doesn't increase because when the clock frequency of the memory increases the number of wait state that they put in for the memory to respond also increases so the it takes about 100 nanoseconds to get the memory cell from somewhere. Um, you just have to wait. Unfortunately, there you can you spend the whole lifetime discussing the memory bandwidth and so on. And that's, that's just a way of life that things are memory bandwidth. Well, it even start complaining here. This is the scaling figure. The scaling is to record the time it takes to, I also have slightly better one of these, but the scaling, it's about how many cores you are using. You can have perfect scaling. Uh, the Pi program yesterday about the circle and um, the square, it's the blue one, para embarrassingly parallel, a Monty Python, not <laughs> Monty Python, um, um, Monte Carlo simulations are normally on the blue one, close to the blue one. It depends on how much reduction you do at the end. Then you have roll off, which is common. And the negative one, it scales nicely as some kind and then goes down because of too small problem size maybe, or, or other problems. Then you have linear scaling. Some programs scale linearly, but um, the, the tangent to them it's less than a half, less than 45 degrees angle. So it's not perfect, but it's linear. We can continue to a program I run. This is the, the NPB benchmark again. Uh, on the left hand side, try if you can. Yep. On the left hand side, you can see I run with two, four, eight, 16, and 32 cores. I recorded the performance and I set the speed up to two because I have two cores. I assume that from one to two, it's, it's perfect speed up. And then I record the speed up from, up from two and plot. And you can see at some point it goes down. It doesn't scale very much better. At 16, it's an optimal. If you employ more than 16 cores, it will actually slow down, which is not very good. So you shouldn't waste cores on that. Check scaling. Going from 128 to 256 core with the way 10% speed up is a waste. So please do check the scaling. And that concludes my talk for 45 minutes. Thank you, Ole. Uh, is there any questions on the HackMD that uh, needs to be answered by Ole Haradoy? I haven't been monitoring the HackMD, but I saw there's a raised hand. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah, please go ahead. Ingo. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, very nice talk. I, I just want to comment on the memory bound. And we had some experience on Betsy that our climate models, they were scaling very well and sometimes better than linear. And it turned out that that was related to the memory bound to the cache utilization that Betsy has actually a lot of level three cache that is much faster than 
the main memory. So reducing the problem size per core can uh, could in our case um, uh, result in a speed up. And, and that is maybe a bit architecture dependent, so it's not something general. But we, I, I think, uh, so improving cash utilization, that's actually a way to address this memory bond issue, but it requires a lot of coding and it, it, it is not easy. So just a comment. <laughs> Well, that's a very good comment. Uh, yeah, it's if you I, I, I have been playing with with the reducing problem size and I even managed to write a, a vector program that do, do the and without any cash at all and see if I could get the theoretical performance, which I could. But of course, the more you can fit into cash, the better. The extreme was the night's landing, which has a memory side cache with high bandwidth memory is actually not what we refer to as high bandwidth memory today because it was on MCM RAM, but it's close to high bandwidth memory. And yes, and, and, and that cached the memory, which helps a lot. And we don't have that on any of, of, of our system. But level three cache, if you can fit parts of your problem or maybe the whole, the whole problem into the, the level three cache, it will speed up tremendously because the memory bandwidth is so much higher. And I don't want to, to point out that uh, the number one system of the top 500 list, the Fugaku system in Japan, they don't have normal DDR memory. They have only high bandwidth memory. They have 48 cores per node and 32 gigabyte of high bandwidth memory. So that's the way to go, but I'm not sure if I can convince Sigma2 to buy a Fugaku system, even a small one. But uh, yes, absolutely. And if you can program your around and utilize the level three memory much better, it, 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 it's very, very good, but it's not for the average user. Thanks. Thank you, Ingo, and thank you, Ule. And I think uh, we can have a break for 10 minutes and we will resume at 10 o'clock. <laughs> 